You're listening to the podcast where we explore the anatomy of the narrative and the subconscious impact pop culture has on the perpetuation of social inequality, where we understand what it means to move from either or to this and more. In episode three, filmmaker David Malone helped us recognize the absurdity of a world where we understand AI through the lens of Hollywood style narratives. He also pointed out the perils of placing humanity's future in the hands of political leadership who were informed through this lens. Or worse, whose interests may not align with a collective good. So what could a world look like where we use artificial intelligence for good? Alex Sado, AI innovator, weighs in. Alex. So by now, if listeners are following the sequence of this season, as they should be, they should know that I start off by tormenting my guests to come up with an actor who would play their younger and adult self in the movie biopic of their lives. And one of your references was David Oyelo as Robert yeah. Katende in Disney's Queen of Katwe. And for those who haven't seen it, he plays the role of a of coach to a young Ugandan chess prodigy, Fiona Mutese, aka the Queen of Katwe. And Katende is a man who's on a mission to encourage the young people in Uganda's slums to develop their innate ability for critical and strategic thinking. So not using the thinking that created the problem to solve it. And Katende's character, I think, couldn't be summed up better in the movie than the quote from Nobel Peace Prize winner and President Ellen Sirleaf Johnson of, of Liberia. The size of your dreams must always exceed your current capacity to achieve them. I found that incredibly, incredibly powerful. You, you were born in Nigeria, in Benin. What led to doing your BA in electrical engineering at Columbia? Frustration. <laughs> <laughs> Frustration. Um, I, I, like you said, I grew up in Benin City in Nigeria, and we probably had electricity for maybe 30, 40% of the time. And um, until a lot of kids grew up thinking they wanted to uh, help solve that problem. And I did too. Physics was my favorite subject. I loved the ele uh, electrical part of it. I, 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 I probably preferred the mechanical side of it, um, but felt, you know what, maybe I'll use the skills I have to try and solve things at home. And I want to fix NEPA is what we called it. That was the utility company, NEPA. Um, and so I went to Columbia to study electrical engineering. But while I was there, I came to learn more about this thing called computer science. It was the first time I would see programming with a computer. It was very difficult, uh, but I eventually picked it up and um, started to work more in the coding space, mostly because of almost instant gratification. You could write three lines of code and the computer is saying hello back to you. Uh, and you, you can build websites and make them look pretty and do important stuff. And for I knew what was happening, I started to, I, I went to Leg, to Abuja, uh, built a couple of interesting applications, doing an internship there. And, and then uh, worked with Goldman Sachs in New York, working, uh, it's just the number one investment back, working on uh, incredibly fast trading platforms. And it was just incredible to see the power of technology and what it could do. So your work experience blends technology with investment equity as per Goldman Sachs and then peak investment. Now, did you forge the bridge between the two on purpose? I was always obsessed with the markets. I still am. I still look at it every day uh, at stocks that are interesting. Um, yes. And so working at Goldman gave me an exposure to seeing all asset classes and figuring out the ones that I would like to trade and also knowing the technology behind the trading platforms to understand why things operate the way they do so that was that was strategic what was also strategic was state was um knowing that i would go to business school in a few years i thought to myself all right yeah get the engineering out of the way that's the harder harder part uh <laughs> and then later on after you know the technology then you go learn the business of how to apply the technology and so um i, I actually took my uh, gmat before i joined goldman so i knew it would expire in five years so I had five years to be at Goldman. And so the three years in, I'm like, all right, time is ticking, apply, and try to get in somewhere. Well, I mean, now you're with NVIDIA, market leaders in artificial intelligence computing, managing product marketing for the data center cloud in California. Mm -hmm. So the other clue you gave me 
to help listeners get to know you better as Iron Man. And I haven't forgot that. I'm saving it for later. <laughs> Meantime, okay, let's geek it out up front and get it out of the way. All right. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of coding. I've edited backend content for a few e-commerce clients. I've dabbled on some online courses on occasion of the past decade. Uh, one was through Santa Fe's Institute of Complexity Science, they, using NetLogo, the uh, multi-agent modeling program. And the other was just a deep learning A to Z. So for our listeners, and a good few Hollywood AI screenwriters, please can you clear up what the difference is between AI, machine learning, and deep learning? Wonderful. I will help here to tell you that uh, uh, people haven't decided yet. Uh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so it's up for grabs. Up, is that what you're saying? Up for grabs. It's up for uh, yeah, conversation and arguments. People talk about this all the time. But coming from um, the space where I was selling these solutions, we had to come up with simple definitions that worked right. Um, the, the engineers and the researchers who actually work on this will tell you that AI is something that passes the Turing test, right, which came up over 40, 50 years ago, you know, where you engage with a computer and you can't tell if it's a human or not, right? That is the absolute definition. Um, but that's not useful in the marketplace when you're selling products. In the marketplace, I keep things simple. I say everything is AI, but if you want to, you know, dig down traditional ai is machine learning where you work with algorithms like decision boosts and a bunch of other ones to uh, make decisions with data um, but then deep learning is when you then increase the number of uh, complex i was going to say number of layers and get all technical here but let's just say you increase the complexity of the model to make it really complex uh, so it can solve even more useful problems then it is deep learning and deep learning is closer to, you know, the, what the, um, uh, what would you call them now? What they call AI, right? That is deep learning. That's when you're able to help uh, computer systems be able to uh, have vision to see, uh, have understanding of language, NLP, and, um, and do a bunch of other things. But for simplicity, let's just call it all AI. And if you want to get, you know, granular, machine learning is simple AI and deep learning is complex AI. So mm -hmm. at this point, if I'm not wrong, coders have enabled the programs to tell the difference between a cat and a dog, but they're still not quite there with language translation. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, language translation continues to improve. How I describe this. So there are different levels of um, cognition for any of any 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 entity for humans and for computers as well right uh vision is one of the simplest entry points for cognition just that's why you can have smaller animals like a small bug can see right you can see and that's why with ai we started with computer vision uh it's uh, if i was to speak do some ai speak it takes maybe 27 million parameters to train an ai to uh be able to uh uh, see and have vision hence we can then uh, differentiate between a dog and a cat language on the other hand is what we tend to say belongs to intelligent beings like human beings uh, because of language and comprehension is actually very difficult for the brain and also very difficult for computers as well so just as it takes like 27 million characters to train uh, you know computer vision it takes about 8 billion character parameters to train <laughs> uh, like uh, the current state of the arts uh, language model, right? That starts to get close to human cognition. Um, and um, 8 billion parameters was several months ago. They've probably doubled that by now. And uh, it, every month, a different company announces something new. NVIDIA, Facebook, Baidu, they keep adding more parameters and making the model more complex. As it gets more complex, it becomes more natural at uh, language. So we're standard. learning amazing things about our own brains by understanding this. It's almost like we take it for granted. We don't really think about it, but then when this happens, we learn. So I have mm -hmm. to use this opportunity to ask you to tell me, to just to talk a little bit to the difference between the Turing test and the concept of uncanny valley. Concept of uncanny valley. Uh, I actually personally don't know much about that. 
right? So you might have to teach me on that then. But with the Turing test, the simple uh, 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 explanation is it came out uh, some 50 plus years ago uh, when the concept of artificial intelligence was first thought of. Uh, and the scientists at that time uh, said that, you know, uh, the Turing test would be a way for you to actually characterize uh, an entity as artificial intelligence, right? It's the point where uh, a co having a conversation or interaction with a computer, uh, on having a conversation with a computer, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it's a computer or a human being. And so that, that was the Turing test. Right. Complete it by telling me more about the Akani Valley. So uncanny value is this is where I was wondering, you know, with the different because I think maybe if you're having the conversation maybe online you you can't tell, but in person, as far as I know, like with Sophia the robot, um, uncanny value is that, that it's the term that's used to explain the moment as a human, you that feeling that you have when you are engaging with something that physically appears to be human but actually it's it's a robot and you get this feeling that something looks like you but actually it's not at all and that that term is called uncanny valley mm -hmm. yeah oh, very that, very interesting that very uncomfortable very strange feeling you get that that thing that looks like you shouldn't and you 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 i, I don't know if it's because you don't know why it shouldn't or because you can't put your finger on it or because you know and it just it's it's like a like a feeling of, of revulsion of some kind. Mm -hmm. That's a very inter interesting uh, concept, and I think it's very complex. I think almost nobody understands how humans, in general, all seven plus billion of us, are going to re re react and respond to such uh, robots. Uh, I yeah, so that's why I personally stay away from trying to do things like that. It's interesting because a lot of really smart AI people I know are almost obsessed with making robots that look more human-like. And I'm like, I choose to focus on other things. I choose to focus on 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 improving, um, using technology to 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 improve access, access to opportunities, and so using AI to make processes more efficient so they can go faster and cheaper and make it easier to serve more people. That's where I like to apply AI. And then I have my friends who just want to make a robot look more human. <laughs> we all have different interests. <laughs> so we could have made it through the whole interview without saying the word robot once. And we spoke before, so there's proof that we could do that. But I had to yeah. make a point because listeners would do well to note that this is, it is the only time this has and will come up during this interview, which is about artificial intelligence. So take that, mm. Hollywood. Yes. Speaking of mainstream <laughs> media, if you yes, want to know more yeah, about it's the, not about robots at all. No, not at all. But it's you know, a choice. It's, it's a it choice. Is. You choose to make it about robots. There's so much more AI is about, and it's not about robots. Precisely. It's. I mean, you know, speaking of mainstream media, I guess if you want to, if listeners want to know more about the Turing test, they can watch the Imitation Game if they haven't seen it already with Benedict Cumberbatch, who plays cryptanalyst Alan Turing, who is part of the team of mathematicians who built the machine to crack the German Enigma code. But question, Alex, how much easier would you, your job be if there were movies more accurately portraying AI? It's a lot easier because uh, I, I see movies as incredibly important influence on, on everyone's lives, my lives and the lives of people. Like, you know, when we don't have access to information in front of us, we turn to media and to television to, to inform us on what it is. And right now, the majority are being informed that AI is only about robots who want to shoot them. And so that's what they believe, but that's not correct. Uh, every single day they use AI on their phone uh, to search for information and they're able to find information that helps them smarter and get you the day better but they have no idea that that is AI. This is the fault of the media and the movies so the movies need to fix that. They better fix that. Most of the the references that we have in pop culture for AI go one way. There are not many tech movies that touch on this genre. I mean Debs just came out on Hulu. I don't know if you've seen that. It combines no. these sort of three elements however they're being interpreted currently with quantum computing but to be honest watching it made my soul feel a little bit dirty it's it's a long story with a lot of spoilers d-e-v-s okay 
yet yeah, on, on Sun Hulu. Uh, there's, so, but there's one mainstream series that was really good. It's, it's startup with, with Eddie Gattegi and Martin Friedman. And th though the plot's about digital currency, it's rare that I've actually seen a tech-themed movie weave in the reality of economic disparities quite like this one. I'm not sure if you've seen Startup. Yeah, it is really good. Yeah, it, okay. it is one of those gems out there that actually mm -hmm. does manage to, to get sort of a grasp on, on the narrative. So I, I had you smile because while I was doing research on you, a comic character actually came to mind. Okay. Professor Charles Francis Xavier, so the leader and creator of the, of the X-Men and founder of Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. And you know I'm bringing this up, right? Because I want to know how Alliance for AI in Africa came about. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> You're crazy. Uh, wow. No one... I've probably only thought about Professor X in relation to Alliance for AI like a few times. And I've only thought about it to myself and I haven't, you know, breathed it out in words. <laughs> um, but that's that's where I'm hoping it gets to in five, ten years. Right. At a point where it it it, it is Professor X, not me. It is Professor X, where if has it has now uh inspired and uh, created this um system where uh there are african rock stars everywhere right rock stars from africa uh who are building world-class solutions to problems facing africa facing the rest of the world and the system knows um the strengths and the weaknesses and those problems and challenges and so knows who to assign where and and we can all work together I uh, think of it as one brain, right? Connecting Africa's AI communities for excellence. You know, like Alliance for AI, I would say we're founded on, uh, I guess, three core principles where we, we uh, first things first, it's about the challenge we face in Africa today is poverty, right? So that first principle is uh, that to eradicate poverty, it's not about providing food, um, um, but by providing a means so the hungry folks can feed themselves. So wealth creation. The second one is around uh, timing, is that this decade is the most important decade in our existence. It's, it's the t period of time when the greatest gap will grow because of deep technologies like AI and blockchain. The rest of the world is adopting it, and those who don't adopt it will be left far behind. So we can't miss this decade, so that's timing. And then the third one is, um, that Africans can build world-class solutions, especially if we do it together. Well, like Professor Xavier, your steering committee consists of some amazing transdisciplinary superheroes, and I'm sensing that that was on purpose. Yes, yes, it's on purpose. It's on purpose. Like, Africa's people, by definition, are incredibly diverse in, in everything in terms of culture, capabilities, weaknesses, um, location. So I figured we'll bring all of them together. And uh, so we don't have a physical office where we're all on, on the internet because that's the only way we're able to uh, operate remote first from day one, like it was already COVID-19. Uh, we were already from like 10 countries on three continents, um, all dialing in with our different capabilities from engineering to research to legal to um, uh, just different spaces. We haven't covered it all. But we have a decent representation today. It's, it's pretty impressive. You're definitely putting things in place. Um, my first guest, uh, we spoke about the importance of, of thinking, of future thinking. Speaking to, uh, I couldn't be speaking to a keener futurist right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, the, the West's idea of advancing AI, and this is really, it's a generalization, is currently, yes, it's mostly profit driven due to who owns the resources and what drives their value systems. Even mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the world's populations all face the same systemic issue, as you said, from equality, climate change, as per UN Sustainable Development Goals. But Africa has amazing case studies of AI innovation across all sectors and, and every SDG, from finance to education, food security, health, and even marine conservation. Can you please 
just tell me a bit more about those. There's so many amazing mm -hmm. ones. I couldn't, uh, couldn't get enough of the website. Usually mm -hmm. it's sort of case studies are not very easy to find, but this was not a problem at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, well, first, first, firstly, in Africa, we can make the same, we can follow the same path that the rest of the world has, has taken, where it's like building just for profitability. Um, but I call on us Africans to not do that. We can take a very different path. We have to decide to do that and, and we, sh we should. We have a great advantage here that uh, one of my mentors shared with me. Her name is Andrea Cates. She said uh, one of Africans' uh, uh, strengths is, is untapped needs. And so I thought people usually talk about untapped resources, untapped strengths. What do you mean untapped needs? Uh, so she didn't explain. So I started to think deeply about it and realize and recognize that, all right, there are these unique, there are these challenges and problems faced in Africa that, um, uh, you know, when you have enough brilliant minds looking at it, they come up with solutions, right, that are, are unique and ac accessible and that work. And um, it's almost like necessity breeds innovation, right? Uh, and, and we have that in Africa. When you look at, uh, especially when it comes to basic core human needs of, of, of healthcare, or providing food security or financial security. Uh, these are basic needs and, and we have them, we have a lot of it in Africa. And if we're able to you know, focus our minds on them, we can come up with solutions that would not just apply to Africa or the rest of the world, right? Uh, to speak specifically about say maybe healthcare and, and one of the companies that excite me a lot is, um, uh, is Tambua Health out of Kenya, right? They're building um, some AI for uh you know medical imaging when i spoke with the founder uh, some two months ago he shared that in kenya it uh costs it costs about um uh to to get an mri machine for those who aren't aware mris take you know scans of the internal organs and help doctors you know diagnose diseases like cancer or even COVID 19 that we're going through um uh it's a very expensive machine right so this founder in Kenya said that it costs uh, the same to build four clinics as to buy an MRI machine. Uh, so that's, that's to speak to why um, there aren't many of them in the country, right? And this is because these machines were designed in the West where there's surplus of resources. And so they design it with everything that's expensive and then sell it for millions of dollars or however much it costs. And so these guys are uh, building out their solutions uh, that uh, one of the ideas they have, think about it, is, is that they will put a, a mobile phone on the back of a patient, right? And then capture sound waves from, from the lungs and then uh, write AI to convert that to an image that can provide enough information for, for a medical professional. Just imagine how wild that is. <laughs> they came up with that because they knew they couldn't buy an MRI and so they could do something different. So that right there is incredible. And so then to talk about something that is even relevant to the times today, COVID-19 is ravaging the entire world. It's a global pandemic. Everyone is like, stay at home. And um, this, the main solutions the entire world is using to deal with these are uh, to prevent the spread by staying at home and not going out for months. Um, Oh, uh, and then if, if people do catch a disease, they go to a hospital, to intensive care, and they use a ventilator and, and an ICU to take care of the patient. Now, these two solutions were not designed in Africa. They were designed in places where there were resources that could support those two solutions. So I, I, I plead on the African innovators listening to this today to recognize that um, Africans don't have the resources to support those two solutions. We will try them because we have nothing right now, but uh, the innovators should really wipe the slate clean, go to a whiteboard and think that, all right, we don't have the $2 trillion to support this stay at home order. Can we design a solution that's completely different, completely based on the weaknesses and strengths that we have as a continent? You spoke about, uh... An, an agricultural uh, food security based, just, I can't remember which, I, I watched everything I could find, so I didn't miss anything. And I can't remember whether it was something you actually spoke about or something I saw or read about. 
um, and it had to do with farmers getting data, but there were two or three in, in, in agriculture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's so many solutions being built on the continent, like I, I even don't have enough resources to go find all of them. Um, but the few I've seen, uh, one is called We Farmer from Kenya again, uh, where they've connected over a million farmers uh, with uh, feature phones, right? They're doing AI and deploying the solutions through uh, SSD or text messaging, where they're able to connect all these farmers and provide any information about uh, things that they care about, uh, like the weather or pricing, right? Uh, before this, these farmers were depending just on prayers, praying for the rain, praying for the sun, praying for whatever, you know, praying that the government gives them good price. But now with this AI based uh, mobile tool, they can ask a question and get a response really quickly. And now they have information. So that's transforming um, how, how they can operate even when it's a subsistence. So you can think of like subsistence farmers now having the kind of information that large scale farmers have, right? We need that in Africa, given that majority of our farmers are, are small subsistence farmers. There was one that I saw about reducing the, the pesticides that are so harmful on so many yeah. levels. I can't remember which one it was. It's from Zambia. It's, um, yeah, there was a solution in Zambia, and then there was AgriPredict is one of the startups. Um, but yes, they use computer vision to um, from drones and other pictures to be able to um, um, have a better view of the enti entire farm and, and uh, check on certain things. For example, check on whether there are pests growing or rather um, weeds growing or whether there are pests uh, you know, uh, harming the plants and be able to act uh, faster, right? So it's identifying and also providing some um, recommendations on how to handle the situation so the farmer is more informed. And they were, um, I don't remember the whole story, but I remember that they were inspired to do this after a big incident in their country uh, that led to, you know, tons and tons of food waste and obviously people going hungry and losing their jobs. And so with their AI, they're going to help save people's jobs and create a lot more jobs which is what Africa needs. Africa needs a ton, a ton of jobs going forward and AI can help. There was one, uh, because that reminds me of the situation with infrastructure in Africa. Everyone perceives that to be developed, you must have a lot of physical infrastructure. And a lot of the times this is from people who need to have the infrastructure to access the natural resources and then take it out of the country and no one in the country benefits from it. Infrastructure helps, but there's a strategy to still succeed without all the infrastructure that the United States has or that China has. Right, I define it in, in different ways. There is an infrastructure for, for building the tools, right? You don't have to have a supercomputer for all 1 billion Africans to build AI before you're ready to use AI. But you can have a small supercomputer for 10 African rock stars to build solutions that 100 million people will use. We can afford that, we already have that. I think you're calling me from South Africa. South Africa has that. South Africa has a supercomputer uh, and they're looking to build more. In fact, um, I'm hoping other countries do similar. Even if they can't build a supercomputer, they can use the cloud, uh, provide access for the great minds in all these countries. All these countries have really great minds, but then they're handicapped right now. They don't have the right tools. And so we can provide those tools for those people and, and they will build and build things that hundreds of millions will use, right? That's what we should care about is that we can build solutions that uh, thousands of farmers can use to produce much more food at home or, or, or build AI tools that healthcare professionals can use in, in villages and remote areas where you would never get enough doctors to go. Like, we should not even think about it. Like, oh, we're trying to train more doctors in Africa. We should continue to keep trying, but we will never train as many as we need. So we need to build tools that help the nurses and help the public health workers to take some of the load of the doctors. Like diagnosing some disease can be done from the mobile phone. Uh, and, and we should be able to, we should look to build those kind of tools 
and, and save lives and, and in, the, in the end help improve our economies and, and well, our well-being. You're talking about doctors, it, it reminded me also when, when we connected on pop culture, you spoke about Black Panther's depic depiction of an improved way of life for people. For example, Shuri, and I quote, Shuri's superior efficiency and effectiveness as a doctor are to the ease of providing basic amenities to the people. And you also mentioned vibranium, the metal mind in yeah. Wakanda that can absorb, store and release large amounts of kinetic energy. Now, metaphorically, it's interesting, vibranium can also be used to understand the as, as, as a um, well as a metaphor to understand the impact of developing AI resources in Africa. So mining not in ore, but data and knowledge that can release kinetic energy. And mm. at this point, it, it reminds me of a, of a Steve Biko quote, and, and I'm and I'm going to paraphrase: "The great global powers have done wonders in giving the world an industrial and military look." But the great gift still has to come from Africa, giving the world a more human face. Now, in the previous episode with David Malone, the filmmaker, we spoke about cultural bias in coding certain AI applications that bear impact on basic human rights. So while there's been an awareness about decolonization in many areas, more recently, importantly, in education, there's a solid amount of ground to cover in terms of data. I understand you have a close associate with a company working in genetics that has some shocking statistics in this regard. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's called uh, 54 Gene out of Nigeria. Um, they had the statistic, if I remember correctly now, that, um, well, first, maybe there's some background. The world is getting, you know, the technologies are getting us to a place where we're able to build personalized solutions. Solutions that, because before now, where most solutions like drugs, medication, they're just built to work for. You know, there's a generic one that is offered to everybody. And, and but because we're all very different, we, we respond differently to the drugs, right? Sometimes they might not work for us or we might have uh, side, side effects, right? And so the world's moving to a place where we're using uh, genetic studies to then be able to produce uh, uh, drugs or methods of care that is personalized to, to, to a person, right? Um, but then the challenge here is this gene pool that is being used today is not representative of the people on earth, right? It's dominated really by uh, the white male. And I imagine there would uh, increasingly be also some, some Asian genes there too. Uh, if you if you look at it, it's really being determined by the people who are building these solutions, right? Because yeah, they think of themselves first, or they're able to find test material from them, their, their places first. Uh, and so, what this company in Nigeria found out was that there's only two percent of that gene pool comes from um, black people, right? Which means um, whatever solutions they build that's going to improve the world is not going to improve the lives of um, black people anywhere. Two percent of the data. Two percent of is, the data. Yeah, um, but black people constitutes well in the U.S. Black people constitutes about fourteen percent of the population of the world. I don't know what that is, but I know that continues to increase. By twenty thirty, uh, Africa will have the largest population of um, um, young people. I think who are in the workforce, uh, and so you mean you're not designing drugs for these people, but the world needs them because you know. They're gonna need the youth, and so that's a huge challenge. And so I'm really, uh, you know, glad that 54 Gene is doing what they're doing. I got to meet uh, Abasi, the founder, um, when we both spoke on a panel at, at Stanford, and they've continued to grow their company. And I believe just last week they raised a new round and, and raised a, a lot of money. So I, I am really happy to see that they're growing, and they continue to contribute what they can to. Um, uh, fixing this, this this huge gap. The same could be said for, for the data available online, for example, from communities, civil societies, coalface NGOs that have the actual knowledge to address the cause of pressing social issues. If this data was online, then there'd hardly be an issue with what to invest in, because for one, there wouldn't be people dropping bread from airplanes anymore, hoping to solve hunger. There's nothing mm -hmm. worse than throwing money at symptoms based on well-meaning assumptions rooted in privileged values instead of a lack of empirical data. And the same goes for corporate social investment and ESG, environmental, social and governance investment, 
we, we touched yeah. on that actually at the end of the first episode. Um, in terms of the need for the focus on the S in ESG, for those not looking at the world from the perspective of Africa or any other developing country for that matter, the important thing, and I'm sure I actually look forward to hearing you talking to this, is to understand about investment strategies is the difference between interventionist aid and leveraging it for sustained social innovation. And Africa's reputation in this regard is ironic, considering its remittances exceed foreign aid. I mean, in fact, mm -hmm. in, I think in 2019, remittances equal or surpassed 25% of GDP in five countries, mm -hmm. whatever GDP yeah. means these days. I mean, GDP could mean how quickly can you consume a country's natural resources to prove an impressive GDP. But I mean, yeah. no, 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 <laughs> Joseph Stiglitz, he's been on, on that since 2008. Um, but I mean, in terms of that, the, 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 the investment strategy that, that defines interventionist aid and social innovation and the availability of data for that, that just, it, when I was on your website, it just struck me that you, you rising to the occasion to go, right, let's do it. Yes, yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Uh, well, we're hoping we're able to, 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 to impact this, this space for sure. Um, uh, one of my uh, other mentors, I first had John Moore, he wrote a, a book uh, with the Christensen Institute called uh, The Prosperity Paradox. I welcome viewers to all read that book. Um, it's one, it's, it's a philosophy I totally subscribe to where it uh, speaks about, you know, uh, aid and, and how just providing aid is, it doesn't, um, it makes people feel good and feel great about themselves that they've helped, but really they're not helping. It's not sustainable. It's what is sustainable is actually uh, uh, helping those uh, people, um, you know, enabling them to create economic value and uh, social value for themselves and their communities. And then it's sustainable, so they can continue doing that, right? And and um, you know, I think he says this a lot better. It would be better if you read the book. But if I was to extend that, I would say even you who's providing the value. Uh, you should also figure out a way to make it even more long-term for you. Perhaps there are benefits you get of this act, as I guess it's just being a gift that's going to run out um, when you, you have other pressing challenges, right? And so how, that's how I, I, I shape things, where it's like you go in and, and treat the other person as, as a very fair business partner, and you both work on solutions that will you know benefit both of you and be sustainable yeah and the irony is the investor almost sometimes learns more from the situation than they even imagine yeah. that they would mm -hmm. are you uh, are you, you addressed policymakers in um in the au or regarding mm -hmm. the au about an intergovernmental platform so in terms of value of data we've discussed to this point it's there's a profound role that it stands to play in releasing that kinetic potential we spoke about earlier in terms of revolutionizing how resources are distributed. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna quote the website now. By sharing resources, expertise, and success stories, all of us people in Africa are finding ways to harness our collective intelligence and focus our efforts on basic yet critical problems affecting us most, gradually improving our qualities of life and building better futures for coming generations. That is very profound. Because an intergovernmental <laughs> platform, I mean, it, it could be a number of things. It could even be the, the start of a multi-stakeholder governance model that relieves the need for hierarchical leadership positions that mm -hmm. uh, in turn then breed actions based on ego tendencies. <laughs> <laughs> you said that. <laughs> I did. Yes, no, there's a lot of potential for such a platform. And I hope um, yeah, people will continue to listen. This, this thing will take time. But slowly but surely, uh, we'll continue to build out these kind of solutions and, and, and drive more of an adoption, right? Um, COVID-19 is a huge challenge. It's a huge pandemic. It's lots of lives are getting lost. But then there is an opportunity to, to work together, right? People are now almost forced to work together. Um, the whole world is facing this challenge. So Africa can't really ask for help. It is asking, but then... I don't know how much it's going to get because the whole world's struggling and uh, it can't just import solutions anymore. It has to build them. It has to uh, turn on its manufacturing plants and, and manufacture masks um, because it can't just import all from China anymore. 
And, and so it's forcing some of these uh, things to happen. As you speak about an intergovernmental platform, I'm actually part of a group that was initiated in South Africa that is now building a, uh, a technology platform that would allow volunteers from across the entire continent to contribute information that is valuable to tackling COVID-19. Uh, that project started three weeks ago, and it's almost complete in terms of launching the technology platform. And, and that would then allow Africans from everywhere to you know, contribute information in terms of news, where the platform curates to ensure it's, it's valuable information and not fake news. And then um, people who build in solutions share what they built so others don't go and you know, rebuild the same thing but we're building on top of them. And you have uh, the heads of, of banks and telcos, all parts of this communication, uh, so that they can also um, provide resources in terms of like cloud credits or um, improved understanding of um, access to data to reduce the cost for people who are building solutions. I mean, it's really incredible. I was really proud to be part of that first call three weeks ago to see Africans coming together to try and solve this problem because uh, we now know we can't get out of it if we don't work together. So there again, is the metaphor of Alliance for AI in Africa, where you include the concept of hashtag one brain, a collective intelligence, a collaboration that mirrors the way nature works almost, where resources are pooled for effective use. So mm -hmm. I mean, imagine, and a good example is the Netflix movie, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, about Malawian mm -hmm. inventor and author William Kamkwamba. He gained fame in his country in, in 2002 when he built a wind turbine to power multiple electrical appliances in his family's house using blue gum trees, bicycle parts, and materials collected from a local scrapyard. A pooling of potential untapped resources in Africa where a little goes a long way is an astounding thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I know it's, uh, I don't know what more I can add to what you just said. It's, uh, it's really, uh, in my view is the only way is the only way um is the only way to to get past the, the challenges that are in front of us as a continent we are uh the smallest continent so far as 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 when it when you look at economic uh, productivity and uh, we really just have to uh we can't afford to be inefficient and to make keep making mistakes and keep making losses and keep being unaware of what other people are doing and doubling the work, doubling the effort when we have just so re few resources to throw out the problem. So the most efficient way and the only way that will work is if we come together and uh, you know bring out all different strengths to complement the other weaknesses and work together. That's the only way. That movie, it's actually the directorial debut of British-born Chiwetel uh, Geofor, if I'm pronouncing yeah, that correctly. Which movie was his first one? My gosh, I don't know. He's he's done so many. I actually lost track, mm. to be honest okay. with you. He's, he just he's one of my favorite actors. And his parents actually come from the same region you were born in Nigeria, the southern area, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually don't know where they're born. I have not looked at I've not looked that up, but uh, no. it, it just yeah. says South Central. Oh, that's what it just says for him. Okay, I'm from Edo State, Benin. HFO, HFO might be from um, pretty close but different. It might be from like Enugu or something. Enugu means the top of the mountain, top of the hill. Um, that's like one of the main eastern, uh, eastern um, states in Nigeria. Yeah, then, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's good to see him using his platform to raise awareness about things. I mean, you don't, this this is only one movie that we can talk about on Netflix for now. And who mm -hmm. brought it? Not Hollywood, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. But yes, no, movies are incredibly important and I'm forming relationships with different people who are growing their movie platforms um, because they also believe in the power of storytelling. So that in a year or two or three or four, as, as we grow collectively, we'll get to the point where we we'll, would we'll want to tell more stories of people using technology to create value. So I think that's missing completely in the African television. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to show that so that the, you know, 
Africans, people coming up, young people, see those as an example of how to create value and drive change as against what they've watched now. I mean, I grew up watching lots of like really funny but rubbish uh, of, of uh, you know, being corrupt, being corrupt politicians or, or just committing many vices as young people. And I can imagine loads, loads of youth who watch that, that's, they thought that was the only option. We need to really change that. And so, yeah, I've been really seeking out and making friends with people who are building futuristic platforms. Um, as I also want to tell new stories, I can read something to you from one of my uh, new friends. She's building an incredible company. She says, um, uh, do you want to change the world? Do you want to build visionary technology that places the African woman and man at the center of the universe again? Do you yearn to live in a world in which nobody clutches their purse when you walk in an elevator or monitors you in stores? Rather, they are in awe because every image they've seen of you reminds them that your ancestry is royalty and genius. Uh, what if the African youth detests bribery because everything they've watched since childhood teaches honesty and integrity? That's powerful. That's powerful. This is the kind of movies you would like to make and those are the kind of stories I would like to write. And um, yeah, I encourage others to do the same. So what she's saying, it reminds me of the only time that that, that that narrative started to shift for Africa was in 2008, where I saw where NEPAD, the New Partnership for Africa's Development, started with their peer review mechanism. And through the peer review mechanism, they started seeing and revealing that a lot of the, the African dictatorial narrative were despots that were placed there by um, by international interests to ensure that their interests were protected. And it's, it, it's interesting to see how NEPAD came through their peer review mechanism and started shifting that whole narrative over time. Uh, I, I remember it was the AUEU, they're having their, uh, their conference. And because of the peer review mechanism, the AU actually in that year, it was 2008 or eight, I think, and they said, look, we know what you up to we know what you're on about now we kind of we get it now just in a very nice way just stop because we now have the data and the information to draw the boundary line with so let's start talking now that we have that information and NIPAD was the reason that that they could do that which I found is really interesting I know it's it's not a, a tech movie but Hotel Rwanda with Don Cheadle finding its way into the mainstream is far, a far better account of the realities Africa faces than the Hollywood ones with the white male lead heroes. So I find it interesting to hear that you cite Rwanda Inc. how a devastated nation became an economic model for a developing world as one of your favorite books. It was just for the listeners context, the genocide claimed well over a million people in 94. France was secretly providing military and diplomatic and financial support as fuel, just for the context of what that country came back from, how a devastated nation became, a, and I know, I, I know I'm a big fan of Donald K. Bruca's leadership as finance minister next to Paul Begani. It is impressive. Yeah, so it is. It, it's an incredible book. It really describes, it describes, well, some of the worst times the country had to go to, and it describes, um, the leadership form from the president, right? Um, and just how he's been able to lead the country for the past more than 20 years and bring them to a place where they continue to improve. They grow at, it's been almost a consistent 10% growth, close to 10% growth every year for 20 years. And to read about just what it takes to do that, right? Uh, I know um, many people, uh, critique, uh, you know, President Kagame for some of his methods, and even I critique him for some of his methods. Um, but then I, I, I have to also recognize that perhaps there are only, I, I doubt there are more than five people in the entire planet who are capable of doing what, you know, President Kagame is doing today. So that is huge. Yeah, that I, I don't think there are more than five people. I don't know who the other four are. It's, it's truly incredible. <laughs> yes, what he's managed to do, how he has managed to 
um, get, get uh, most people in the country to work together to continue to improve and improve and improve and grow. And, and it's an incredible model for, for the rest of the continent and other uh, nations across the world, uh, especially frontier nations, on how to perhaps come out of um, uh, such a, a, a bad place, right? There was one other, I guess, one other anecdote. What Rwanda is doing for, for Africa. Before um, I attended the conference, I think it was at Wharton last year, and uh, one of the speakers was saying that in the past, if you wanted to sell a technical solution or some whatever solution to an African government, uh, they will ask you, so has America done it before? Or, you know, yeah, has, has the West done this? If you said no, it was an innovation from Africa, they'd be like, get out of my office, like it's unimportant. They only buy solutions from America or from China, right? It's not possible to innovate from Africa. That's the belief of most African governments. Um, but with Rwanda, there is a new opportunity now where they also they ask, has Rwanda done it? That is powerful. That is powerful that the Rwandan model is beginning to get other Africans to start to believe in themselves as, um, you know, problem solvers. And I, I, I truly, I, I always see it getting better from here. So apart from all the amazing initiatives in AI education, facilitating the inherent brilliance of Africa's youth, are there any programs that you have that encourage the broader uptake of physics considering the advent of quantum computing? Uptake of physics? Yes. Not specifically, not specifically, especially given that that was my favorite subject, right? <laughs> I thought, yes, yeah, quite ironic. I remember you saying, I was like, that's interesting. I have a question about that. Yes, yes, yes. Not specifically about physics. I think from our end, the most, uh, yes, we are talking to folks about a specific technology, artificial intelligence, just because it's the most important technology discovered in, uh, by humanity in terms of how it uh, increases uh, productivity. It helps you waste less and creates completely new opportunities you never saw before. So it's very important. So we're talking about that one technology. But what's more important than that is that we're trying to get in the minds of students and people who consume our material, uh, the importance of leadership and character. That actually was more important because we're thinking once they get those two things right, they can then apply it to any other technology. AI is not the end. In three years, it might be blockchain. After that, it might be 3D. Or for some others, it might be physics. So you can learn whatever you want to learn and use it to solve your problems. But first, what you need is leadership and character. And so those things we bring in with our material. So one example, we, we, we make people aware of African history of innovation before uh, uh, the 1500s, before slavery and before colonization. There was intense innovation happening in Africa before that period. And it was only, st it was stopped by force. And so we, we helped these kids, kids learn about fractals, the origin of binary numbers and all of those things and how they came from Africa. Uh, and so that they know that, you know, they have it in them. And it's just incredible to see how their eyes brighten up when they see it. It reminds me, it takes me back to the movie Queen of Catway. That's why I said that, because all those kids he was teaching to play chess they, from the village, they all thought their lives were useless and they weren't capable of anything until he started to share with them what was possible. And for you know what happened, three of them went and competed on a national level. And then the one girl went and competed on a global level because of, you know, just how uh, they were now aware of their, cap uh, you know, how capable they were of, sh of changing the world. Sentence, I always go around saying, I mean, on my personal website, alexhado.com, I think it says there, my life's work is to bring Africa's voice back to the table. Yes. What it doesn't say is how I complete that statement. I say, bring it back to the table because it's been removed for the last 500 years. Right, which is just what you said with yeah. the, you know, the, the paradox, like the African voice has been missing from that yeah. story. Yeah. Uh, I think that people from all parts of the world have different perspectives. We have all experienced the world differently, right? And so we know different things about it. And it all has to come together in a full circle for us to continue to live here sustainably. 
But right now, there's a whole quarter of it that has been removed. And so we're operating with incomplete knowledge as humanity. It, it, we really need to come together. And speaking of, of amazing leadership, uh, that brings us to Iron Man, because I promised I'd come back to that. But I can see it now. <laughs> Alex Sado inherits millions, then turns uh -huh. it into billions oh, by wow. investing in incredible <laughs> tech and gets funding from S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh, actually, no. shield. <laughs> there is a because shield. Because that's how it works, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, where yeah. can we learn more about AI for Africa and the talks you've given online? And yeah, very simply, uh, look for the words Alliance for AI anywhere. Alliance for AI, Alliance for Africa's Intelligence. Uh, when you go on the website, you'll be able to find all this information around, um, you know, just what Africans are doing with this technology and um you know inspirations from success stories to a list of the leaders over 50 leaders in africa who are working with ai and and this technology and then you also find a list of of over 80 startups over 80 training programs on the continent that are teaching ai like we didn't set these folks up like they exist we just our job is just to tell the aggregated story and bring them together so they're connected and can learn together exchange best practices and grow and um yeah just check it out join the newsletter for sure because there you you know learn about uh, updates on what's happening every two weeks and um yes definitely leave us feedback uh, on on what you think and uh, how you might like to help as well so that we continue to grow this now that we realize how important it is to consider the narratives that drive the way we understand artificial versus human intelligence, machine learning versus human understanding, and deep learning versus deep humanity, we can take the next step in being able to make the distinction in the media going forward. In episode five, philosopher and post-humanist Dr. Francesco Ferrando helps us guide the step of the journey. Thank you for listening. This is Janique Randolph.